Well, this evening, we are going to be turning to the New Testament of the Bible. We will be exclusively in the Gospels this evening. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what we want to do tonight is answer the question, what did Jesus believe about the Bible? What did Jesus believe about the Bible? And the reason we need to answer this question is, is because I've heard it so many times before. Uh, someone will say, well, you know, I don't necessarily believe all the things that you believe, but I believe in Jesus. Someone might say, well, I don't necessarily believe that God created everything, but I believe in Jesus and I follow his teachings. Or I don't necessarily believe that there was an Adam and an Eve, or that there was a flood a long time ago and the whole earth was flooded, but I believe in Jesus. Or I don't necessarily believe that everything in the Bible is true, but I believe in Jesus and I follow him. And the question I have tonight is this, okay, well, what did Jesus believe about the Bible? Because the thing that many people don't realize is, is that Jesus' view of scripture was extremely high. The way that he talked about scripture, the way that he used scripture, the, the words that he chose when he quoted scripture reveals that he had the highest view possible of the word of God. And what I want to show you tonight is, is that someone cannot claim to be a follower of Jesus and not believe this book. It's just that simple. If Jesus is the one we follow, then we must believe his book. I want to begin tonight by showing you what Jesus believed was the nature of the scriptures. I'd like you to turn to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verse 36, I just want to briefly show you what Jesus said when he quoted a passage of scripture. And it is the way that Jesus introduces and quotes the scriptures which is so revealing. It says in Mark 12, verse 35, as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David. And of course, the Christ is the Messiah. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew Messiah. So how can the scribes say that the Christ or the Messiah is the son of David? And then Jesus says, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet, quoting Psalm 110 verse 1, which by the way is the most quoted Old Testament passage of scripture in the New Testament. Psalm 110 verse 1, it's quoted numerous times in the New Testament by various different people. But notice how Jesus introduces the scripture in verse 36. He says that David himself, David was the author of Psalm 110, King David wrote Psalm 110, he says, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, meaning that I am making an argument here, Jesus is saying, and as I quote scripture, these are not merely the words of King David, but these are the words that King David said in the Holy Spirit or under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus is saying that Psalm 110 is not merely the words of King David, but rather it is the words of the Holy Spirit, the very word of God. And so we begin by Jesus' very simple belief. And when I say simple, I mean very plain, very straightforward belief that the scriptures are not merely man's words, but God's words. You must understand that Jesus sees the Bible as a divine book. And so anyone who claims to be a Christian, anyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus should agree with Jesus that the Bible is not merely the word of man that tells us about God. Oh, no, no, it's so much more than that. The Bible is the very word of God himself. It is God telling us about himself and his creation. And that is how Jesus saw the scriptures. Now going into greater detail, turn back to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. In many places, Jesus, when he is posed with a question, he will often answer it with a question 
or he will quote a passage of scripture to answer the question. Now we saw in Matthew 4 when Satan tempted Jesus that Jesus always answered Satan by quoting scripture. He saw scripture as the answer to all of the the temptations that Satan was throwing his way. And so this is not the first time Jesus has done this, but I'm choosing to go to Matthew 19 because of the specific things that Jesus says in this passage of scripture. I want to begin in Matthew 19 verse 3. We know that the Pharisees throughout the Gospels were trying to trick Jesus and to trip him up and and to somehow get him teaching something that they could arrest him for or even kill him for. And so in Matthew 19 verse 3 it says, And the Pharisees came up to him, to Jesus, and they tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now there was a debate uh, in the time of Jesus, there were two schools, the schools of Hillel and Shammai. Uh, Hillel taught that there were only a few reasons why a husband might be able to divorce his wife. Uh, Shammai was another rabbi who taught that there were any number of reasons, really endless reasons, why a husband would divorce his wife. It was basically a more conservative and a more theologically liberal school who were in a debate. But it's interesting because when Jesus answers the question, he doesn't side with either. Rather than answering the question with when it's okay to get a divorce, Jesus basically says, well, don't. (laughs) His answer in verse 4, when he answers the question of when is it okay to divorce your wife, he says in verse 4, he, Jesus answered, have you not read? Now just stop right there. Have you not read? In other words, Jesus is saying, you men have been having this theological debate over when it's okay to divorce your wife. Jesus says, have you not read? Meaning, have you not gone to God's word and read what God has said? Your your opinion does not matter. What matters is, what does the word of God say? So he says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You should notice the verse that Jesus is quoting there. It's Genesis 2.24. It is when God brought Eve to, uh, Eve to Adam, and it is the definition of marriage in the Bible. That in a marriage, a man leaves his father and mother. He is joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Jesus says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Essentially, Jesus says, you shouldn't divorce. I'm not going to get into the debate of when it's okay to, don't do it, is what Jesus says. Then they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. Now, I don't want to answer all the questions concerning the question of divorce and remarriage and those sorts of things. I've taught on that before. That's not what I'm teaching on tonight. But Jesus' basic instruction here is you need to stay with your spouse, okay? That's Jesus' basic instruction. If you want to know what he has to say on that question, you you need to to do all you can to save and protect your marriage. But now getting to the question of how Jesus handles scripture, because that's what we really want to address tonight. Notice, when they ask the question, Jesus goes to the scripture. Because to Jesus, it is the Bible that has the answers to our theological questions. He's not interested in what someone's opinion is. He's interested in what the scriptures say. And he asks them, have you not read? to say that to the Pharisees and the scribes who had large portions of the Old Testament uh, memorized, committed to memory, and many of them had memorized the opening chapters of the book of Genesis. For him to say, have you never read the beginning of Genesis is really a rebuke. Of course they had read it, but Jesus' point is, you're acting like you've never read it before. 
This is basic elementary biblical knowledge and Jesus says, and you're acting as if you've never heard about Adam and Eve and how God brought them together in marriage. What is his point? It is this. That the one who created them from the beginning made them male and female. When does Jesus say that God created Adam and Eve? From the beginning. That, that's very interesting. What this uh, reveals is, is first off, Jesus believes that the Bible is historically accurate. You see, many people say today that Genesis 1 through 11 in particular, and maybe other parts of the Bible, but many people today hold that Genesis 1 through 11, those, those chapters before you get to Abraham, that those are just, uh, those are stories. Those are allegory. Those are just teaching stories. But it's not real history. It didn't really happen. There wasn't a real Adam or an Eve or a Noah or a flood or anything like that they will say. Those are just stories that are given to teach us something, but it's not real history. There's a problem with that. Jesus didn't think it was just a story. Jesus says, from the beginning, God created Adam and Eve, male and female, and he brought them together in marriage. So the first thing is, is Jesus believes that from the very beginning of the Bible, it is historical fact. And what it says happened in time and history. Therefore, if you do not believe in a literal Adam and Eve whom God created, then you're not following the teachings of Jesus because that's part of what Jesus taught. If you call yourself a Christian, but you don't believe there was an Adam and an Eve whom God created before all things, you're not following the teachings of Jesus. Therefore, if you embrace the modern worldview of Darwinian evolution, you are abandoning the teaching of Jesus. Jesus did not believe that we came from someone or something else or that we evolved in any way. Jesus believed that from the very beginning of creation, God created man and woman. From the dust of the ground, he created man. And from the man's rib, he created the woman. Notice also Jesus says that God did it from the beginning. And he repeats that later. In verse 8, he says, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. In other words, it was never God's intention that husbands and wives would divorce. And Jesus is saying, you need to do all you can to avoid that. And it's so interesting that he says that God's intention for marriage existed from the beginning. What does that mean? It means that Adam and Eve existed from the very beginning of God's creation. And I just want to throw this out there for you to think about. If the world is billions and billions of years old, and Adam and Eve, we know we can date their lives to about 4,000 BC when we use the dates that the Bible gives us, tracing back the genealogy of places like Genesis chapter 5 and, and the beginning of the book of 1 Chronicles. We know that Adam and Eve were alive from about the year 4000 BC. The question then is, so if the earth existed for billions and billions of years, and then after billions of years, Adam and Eve came into the picture, then why does Jesus say that Adam and Eve existed from the beginning? Wouldn't he, they have existed at the very tail end of history? What I'm saying is, is it's very clear to me that Jesus believed that Adam and Eve were created on the sixth day of creation. And Jesus believed in what is called a young earth. He believed that the earth is, is not billions of years old, but that it was created on the sixth, that man and woman were created on the sixth day after the heavens and the earth. And so once again, if we reject what Jesus believed about creation, and I just want to back up and say, he ought to know when things were made, he made it. Okay, he did it. He ought to know what happened. I find it amazing that when we talk about when things were created and what was done, we don't first go to the one who was there when it happened. None of us were there when he did it, but he did it and he was there and he knows how it happened, when it happened, why it happened and so forth. And I find it amazingly arrogant to think that we know more about creation than Jesus, the creator. 
Colossians 1.15 says that Jesus is the creator of all things. And so if we don't ask the creator of all things first about our doctrine of creation, there's a problem. If we are Christians, if we claim to follow the teachings of Jesus, then we should believe what Jesus believed about Adam and Eve and about creation. Next, I would like to turn to Matthew 22. Matthew 22, Jesus again is questioned about the scriptures and it's very revealing how he answers the questions here. Now, I want to begin reading in verse 23 so you hear the question and then in verse 29, Jesus will begin to answer. In verse 23, it says, that same day Sadducees came to Jesus. Sadducees did not believe in life after death. They did not believe in a resurrection. That's going to become important here. When Jesus talks about the resurrection, um, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection or in any life after death. So the same day Sadducees came to Jesus who say that there is no resurrection, and they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and third down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, which of course they don't believe in, they're being kind of smart aleck here, is the official terminology. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her, meaning they all were married to her. They've essentially created this convoluted story in which they think they can disprove the doctrine of the resurrection and life after death. And I don't want to go into the question of what this means for the resurrection. Clearly, Jesus believed that in eternity we will, we will live either forever in heaven or in hell. He obviously believed and taught the resurrection. But that's not the question we're answering. I want you to hear how Jesus answers their question with the scripture. Verse 29, it says, But Jesus answered them, You are wrong. And I just love how plain Jesus is. He says, You're wrong. You don't believe in the resurrection, and it's not that you have a mere difference of opinion or a different interpretation. Jesus says, no, you're just wrong. And sometimes we just need to be that plain about it, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus just looks at him and says, eh, you're wrong. He says, you are wrong. Why are they wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Now, to say that you don't know the power of God, he's essentially saying you're lost in your sin, you're unsaved, you're unregenerate, you don't know the converting power of the Holy Spirit of God. You don't know God personally. You don't know the power of God's grace and salvation. But not only is he saying that they are lost in their sin and they are spiritually blind, and that's part of the reason that they have a wrong belief, but he also says... You're wrong because you don't know the scriptures. In other words, what Jesus is saying here is if your beliefs differ from the Bible, then you're just wrong. Now, I know that sounds so simple to us today, but stop and think about that person who says, well, I don't believe in everything the Bible teaches, but I believe in Jesus. Jesus would say to that person, well, you're just wrong. Because if you don't believe what the Bible says, you're wrong. And it's so simple, yet it's so plain in the New Testament. Jesus says, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And so I, I would just say, brothers and sisters, that anyone who has a low view of the Bible or anyone who believes that the Bible has errors in it, that there are things in the Bible that are untrue, they have a different view of the Bible than Jesus. And they cannot rightly call themselves a follower of Jesus if they reject the entire worldview of Jesus. You can't reject the core teachings of Jesus and still say you follow his teachings. You can't do that. And so 
plain and simple, anyone who says, I don't believe the Bible, shouldn't honestly call themselves a Christian. They're just not being honest with themselves. And they might say, well, I believe in the teachings of Jesus, love your neighbor and love God. That's wonderful. But what did Jesus say about the greatest commandment and the second, love God and love your neighbor? He says, for that summarizes everything in the law and the prophets. What were the law and the prophets? The Old Testament, which was the Bible, which existed at that point in time when he said those words. Isn't that interesting? Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor because that's what the Bible teaches. And so even that very basic message that even theological liberals will say they embrace, love God and, and love your neighbor, Jesus says, that's the summary of what scripture teaches. Jesus says that's true because the Bible says so. And so Jesus' entire worldview is God has revealed himself to us and what he demands of us in the Bible. And so if you want to answer a question, Go to the Bible and find the answer. And so if you have a low view of scripture, you simply don't approach all the questions of life the way that Jesus did. You really cannot say you're following Jesus if you don't answer the questions and believe the things that Jesus believed. Matthew 24. We see again something very plainly that Jesus believed that so many today who call themselves Christians don't believe. Matthew 24, verse 37. Jesus here is teaching about the day when he will return and how when he comes back to the earth in judgment uh, that people will be swept away in judgment and he compares the second coming to the flood of Noah's day. Matthew 24, verse 37. He says, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood... They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, did you know what Jesus said about, did you notice what he said about people in Noah's day. They were going on about their lives, doing their normal thing. Noah entered the ark and the flood came. And what did he say about the people on the earth in Noah's day? The flood swept how many of them away? All of them away. You ever heard someone say, well, listen, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus, but I don't really believe that God flooded the whole earth and killed everyone. Okay, well, then you're wrong and you disagree with Jesus. You just, you just don't believe that, and Jesus did. Let's be honest about it. And you see, part of what you need to understand is it's also very circular to say, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe everything in the Bible. Because where is the one place we can learn about what Jesus believed? The Bible. It's not like we have some other historical records that tell us about what Jesus taught. I mean, we have later church history, but when they tell us about what Jesus believed, what do you think the early leaders in the church quoted when they wanted to tell us about what Jesus taught? The Bible. So yeah, you can go to Tertullian and other early church fathers and find out what Jesus taught, but Tertullian is simply going to tell you what Matthew recorded that Jesus taught. And so the point is, is if you throw out the Bible as a theological foundation, but you say, I still believe in Jesus, then that's like saying, I don't believe the Declaration of Independence, but I believe all those things that Thomas Jefferson taught. I mean, his, his whole worldview and everything was contained in the document. You reject the document, but you say you follow the teacher. That doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen. The New Testament is our singular historical source. It's not one source. It's several sources contained together. I mean, the sources are 27, the 27 books of the New Testament. But nonetheless, we don't have other historical sources about Jesus other than some references by a historian here about this guy Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. But we can't learn much about what Jesus taught by looking at secular historians. The one who wrote down his teachings were his followers. They're the ones who wrote the New Testament. 
And so to say that you believe in Jesus and what he taught, but you don't believe what the Bible says is circular reasoning, and frankly, it's nonsense. It makes no sense whatsoever. John chapter 10, verse 35. This is just such a plain statement. For Jesus, you know, some people often, they think that people like myself who believe the whole Bible is true, it's what's often called the doctrine of inerrancy, meaning that everything in the Bible is true. Therefore, if everything in the Bible is true, there's nothing in the Bible that is false or an error or untrue. And so I believe in what is called the doctrine of inerrancy, which says because the whole Bible is true, there's nothing in it that's wrong. It's a very plain doctrine, but many um, people today reject it because they don't like something that's in the Bible. They, they want to take out certain parts of Scripture that they're not comfortable with and say, well, that's not necessarily true. Well, let's see how Jesus dealt with people who did that, who wanted to take out certain parts of the Bible and say, I don't believe that part. John chapter 10. Now, Jesus says at the beginning of this, he says that uh, he is the shepherd of the sheep. He says that he is one with the Father. And he essentially, as he's already done in John's gospel, he claims to be God in human flesh. So, for instance, he says, John 10, verse 29, My father, who has given them, talking about his sheep, his church, Christians, he says, My father, who has given them to me, he is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them, my sheep, out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. Jesus claims to be one with God the father, which is to claim to be God, okay? Verse 31, then the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Why were they going to stone him? Verse 32, Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? And the Jews answered him, it is not a, for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Now, does Jesus go, what? No, guys, you misunderstood me. I'm not claiming to be God. Does he say that? No. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, is it not written? You see, what does Jesus go to? The Bible. He says, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. Now, I don't want to go through Psalm 82 and what it says, but let me kind of summarize it for you here so this isn't throwing you for a loop. In Psalm 82, God is condemning the rulers of this world. It, it says that they are mere men. God says to them, you are gods, meaning that there are people who worship them. Many of the ancient rulers were worshiped as a god. God is calling them gods with a little g so as to mock them. Okay, so it's, God's not saying that there are other gods that exist. He's saying that the rulers of the world act like gods and he's essentially going to destroy them and he calls them nothing but mere men in the next verse. So just keep that in mind. Don't let this throw you for a loop as if it teaches in the Bible that there's more than one God. It does not. Anyways, Jesus says, does it not, is it not written in your law, I say you are gods? If he, meaning if God the Father... If he called them gods to whom the word of the Lord, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you were blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? In other words, God called the rulers of this world gods with a little g, and if he's willing to do that, how can you, and, and God punishes them and rejects them, then how can you? reject the one whom God the Father has set his approval on because he calls himself the Son of God. Jesus' argument here is, is that if God the Father used the term of the rulers of the world and he rejected them, then why would it be so blasphemous to place it on the one who came from God and God has set his seal of approval upon the one who is the Son of God? And in the middle of that statement, Jesus says, now remember, the scriptures cannot be broken. What does he mean? This is what he means. Your Bible is a whole. You can't pick and choose which parts of it you want to believe. It cannot be broken. It's either all of it or none of it. 
If you get to sit over scripture and say, that part's true, that part's true, no, that's not true, that part's true, I don't like that, we need to change that, that part's good, but not over here, I don't want to believe that. Jesus says you can't do that. The scriptures cannot be broken. And so what Jesus is saying here to his opponents is, it's either all or none. You either accept what the word of God says or you don't. But scripture cannot be broken. So when a person says, well, I believe in Jesus, I just don't believe the whole Bible, Jesus says, that's not possible. You have to either accept what scripture teaches or you're not following Jesus. And so I know it is so popular among liberal theologians and more liberal denominations to say, well, we follow the ethical, moral teachings of Jesus. You know, we, we, we want to feed the poor and the hungry. We don't necessarily believe all these things about history and how they had to conquer the land of Israel and all these things. We don't necessarily believe God parted the Red Sea and all that. We know that's just a bunch of fairy tales. But, but we believe in feeding the poor. And Jesus says, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't get to pick which parts of this book you're going to believe. It cannot be broken. You either believe it all or you don't. Lastly, the most important passage of them all is Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And this is the one that we really should turn to the most when we ask the question of what did Jesus believe about the Bible now notice, I'm not taking you to all the other passages where other authors of Scripture tell you about the Bible. 2 Peter 1.21, I quoted this morning where Peter says that Scripture is such that when the authors of Scripture wrote, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But we're not asking the question of what did the Apostle Peter believe, because he believed the same thing Jesus did, and so did Paul and John and Moses and Isaiah and all the others. But right now, we just want to ask the question, what did Jesus believe? Because there are people out there who say, well, I believe what Jesus did, but not necessarily Paul or Peter, okay? And so the question is, can you call yourself a Christian and not believe this book? Luke 24, what did Jesus have to say about the scriptures, namely the Old Testament? You know the road of the, you know the story of the road to Emmaus. There are these two disciples going along, and they're talking about how they were let down. They thought Jesus was the Christ, and he was crucified. They didn't know that he was risen. And the risen Jesus comes walking up behind them and overhears their conversation about how they wish Jesus had risen from the dead. And he kind of asks them, "Hey, what you guys talking about?" And they say, "Hey, are you the only one in all of Jerusalem who doesn't know what has happened?" The funny thing was, he was the only one who knew what happened. Uh, and they had no idea. Uh, but anyways, he gets them talking about this and how they were hoping he was really the Christ and now they felt like he wasn't because he was crucified and he's dead and he's gone. And at the end of them explaining how disappointed they are, Jesus says in Luke 24, verse 25, and he said to them, O foolish ones. Well, why are they so foolish? Here's why and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Who are the prophets? The men who wrote the Old Testament. He says, oh foolish ones, slow to believe all of the Bible. Jesus is saying, if you believed the Bible, you would know better. The reason that you don't understand is because you don't believe the message of Scripture. That's your problem. O oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And it's not just written, it's spoken because they spoke from God. They, they, yes, they wrote it down, but the idea is it is the very word of God spoken by his prophets. It, it, it connotes the authority of the Bible, that it's, it's coming from the very mouth of God through the prophets. Verse 26, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory. Now, what does he mean, was it not necessary? Well, if you trace this idea through the Gospels, Jesus keeps saying, it is necessary that the Christ should come, suffer and die at the hands of sinful men and be crucified. What is he saying? The scriptures prophesied that the Messiah would be 
would suffer and die and he would be crucified for the sins of people. And so what he is saying is, it had to happen this way because scripture predicted it. And scripture is true. And if scripture said that the Messiah had to die, then the Messiah had to die. That's Jesus' point. And so he's basically, he is, is rebuking these men saying, you should have expected the Messiah to die. You were told that was going to happen in the Old Testament. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Verse 27, listen to this carefully. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Now, what is Moses? It's Genesis through Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, which, by the way, there's also a huge debate about, well, who wrote the first five books of the Bible? I have the answer for you. Moses did. How do I know that? Because Jesus said Moses wrote them. Okay, and if Jesus said Moses wrote Genesis, Moses wrote Genesis, period, end of story, no more discussion. He's God, I think he know, knows who wrote the book, okay? And, and, and for the liberal theologians who have uh, these different ideas about who wrote the first five books of the Bible, uh, if you look up the documentary hypothesis, which is something I had to study and wasted my time studying, frankly, in college and seminary, learning what all these German liberals thought about the four men, J, E, D, and P, who wrote the Bible and it was later compiled and all this kind of stuff. One day I was just reading my New Testament and Jesus quotes from Genesis and he says, have you not read what Moses wrote? And he quotes Genesis. And I'm saying, wait, Jesus said Moses wrote Genesis. There's your answer. If Jesus is God and you believe that Jesus is God and Jesus says Moses wrote Genesis through Deuteronomy, then how can you not believe that Jesus is right about who wrote the first five books of the Bible? Are you telling me that you think Jesus is God? He can create the heavens and the earth, but he got it wrong about who wrote the first five books of his Bible? Are you kidding me? And yet that is what some professors in non-Bible believing universities and seminaries teach. And it is baffling. They say they're Christian. They say they believe in Jesus, but Jesus got it wrong on who wrote Genesis. Listen, if Jesus said Moses wrote Genesis, we don't have to argue about it. You either believe what he said or you don't. And so it says, beginning with Moses and the prophets. What are the prophets? It's everything after Deuteronomy. Now, typically, they would speak of the law and the prophets. The law is what Moses wrote, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Later, they would call it the prophets and the writings. In Hebrew, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the writings. But most typically, Jesus just called it the law, referring to the Old Testament, or as here, Moses and the prophets, or the law and the prophets. He's just referring to the whole Old Testament. So beginning with Moses and all the prophets, let me translate that, working through all 39 books of the Old Testament... Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures, just in case you didn't get it, every book of the Old Testament, not just a few, all 39 books of the Old Testament, Jesus interpreted to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning who? Himself. So here's something. Jesus believes that all the books of the Old Testament are about Jesus. Now that is amazing. Who is Genesis about? Jesus. Who is Ruth about? Jesus. Who are the Psalms about? Jesus. Every book of the Bible, the 39 books of the Old Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament are about Jesus. Why? Because Jesus said so. He knows. So again, I ask you the question, how can someone say, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe the Old Testament has anything to do with Jesus. I'm sorry, Jesus said it did. I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in Adam and Eve. I believe we evolved from lower species. I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in a global flood. I'm a Christian, but I don't really believe that God would command Joshua and the Israelites to go in and conquer the land of Canaan. I'm sorry, Jesus said so. If you believe in Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, and you reject the fundamental teachings of Jesus, 
Why are you calling yourself a follower of Jesus? So ladies and gentlemen, just plain and simple, do you have to believe the Bible is true to be saved? No, believing the Bible is true is not necessary to be saved. But you have no reason to believe the gospel unless you believe the Bible is true. Can you be saved without believing in the doctrine of inerrancy? Sure you can. But why would you believe the gospel if you didn't believe the book that tells you the gospel is true? Why would you become a Christian if you didn't think this book was true? Here's what I'm saying. You are not saved by believing this book is true. You are saved by what Jesus did on the cross for you and by trusting in his finished work. However, why would you believe that the work is finished if you didn't believe the book that tells you about what Jesus has done is true? In other words, liberalism, which essentially theological liberalism rejects the Bible as true and it picks and chooses which parts it wants to believe, if any, Theological liberalism cuts the entire foundation out from under the Christian faith. It's like trying to build a house on sand with no foundation. And why is anybody surprised when that house falls? Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word and for each one here. And Lord, I just pray tonight that as I've spoken very straightforwardly and boldly about these things, I know that there are many in this world who would laugh but I really don't care what men think I care what you think Lord and we know what you think because we are told what you think in scripture we can see what you have said about your own word and we know that it is true God forgive us for wanting to be accepted in the eyes of men I frankly don't care what people think about me because I believe in a real Adam and Eve, or I believe that there really was a flood. Lord, you know. You were there. They were not. You are God. We are not. And we humbly submit to your wisdom contained in your scriptures. Help us to remember that this book that we call the Bible is your very word. And that if we want to hear God speak, all we have to do is open our Bible and start reading. Lord, I pray that we would not forget how precious the scriptures are. Thank you that you have so faithfully preserved them for us that we have them today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.